Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Stephen Evans, Executive Director of PhotoFest here in Houston, Texas. And uh, thanks for joining us for another in our series of Creative Conversations Digital. This is a series that we started um, amidst COVID and it's been very successful. And we thank everybody that's joining us for the first time tonight and all of all of you who have been coming back to see our talks that are discussions on photography and contemporary culture, um, uh, pressing and vital discussions, we think. And um, it's our pleasure really to bring this programming to you. And you can also see it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's also archived there, which is um, YouTube and our page is under PhotoFest INTL. F-O-T-O-F-E-S-T-I-N-T-L. And you can link to all of that through the PhotoFest webpage at F-O-T-O-F-E-S-T dot O-R-G. Tonight, I'm really excited to be presenting David Levi Strauss and Roberto Tejada in conversation, two good friends to PhotoFest. And um, it's great to have them back and doing programs again for us. Um, it's very exciting. And we wouldn't be able to do these programs without our supporters, our major institutional and individual supporters that include the Houston Endowment, the Brown Foundation, Inc., the National Endowment for the Arts, the City of Houston through the Houston Arts Alliance, the Texas Commission on the Arts, the Philip and Edith Leonian Foundation, the Powell Foundation, the Wortham Foundation, David and Martha Moore, the WWW Foundation, the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, Nina and Michael Zilka, and supporters of the PhotoFest Annual Fund, and of course, the PhotoFest Board of Directors that supports our work throughout, and um, we, we thank all of them. Um, it's uh, great to have you also here, so I can plug our program coming this Saturday. So please join us uh, this Saturday, August 15th at 2 p.m. for another Creative Conversations Digital featuring Rosanna Polino, one of the artists of the recent PhotoFest Biennial African Cosmologies in conversation with Martha Scott Burton. David Levi Strauss is the author of Co-Illusion, Dispatches from the End of Communication from the MIT Press uh, this year. Photography and Belief, uh, also coming out this year from David's Werner books. Words Not Spent Today by Smaller Images Tomorrow from Aperture. From Head to Hand, Art and the Manual from Oxford University Press. Between the Eyes, Essays on Photography and Politics with an introduction by John Berger from Aperture in 2003 with a new edition uh, in 2012. And Between Dog and Wolf, Essays on Art and Politics. In case something different happens in the future, Joseph Boys and 9-11 was published by Documenta 13 and To Dare Imagining Ruhava Revolution was edited by Strauss, Michael Tossig, Peter Lamborn Wilson and Dilar Dirick and published by Autano Media in 2016. The critique of the image is the defense of the imagination edited by Strauss, Tossig and Wilson will be published by Autano Media in October of this year. Strauss was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2003 and received the Infinity Award for writing from the International Center for Photography in 2007. He is the chair of the graduate program in art writing at the School of Visual Arts in New York. And he'll be joined later in the conversation by Roberto Tejada the author of art histories that include National Camera, Photography, and Mexico's Image Environment from Minnesota Press, and Celia Alvarez Munoz, from, also from Minnesota in 2009, as well as catalog essays included in Now Dig This, Art and Black Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980, published by the Hammer Museum, and the Manil Collection's forthcoming exhibition, Alora and Casadilla, Specters of Noon, uh, published by Yale next year. He has published po the Poetry Collection's Full Foreground from Arizona in 2012, Exposition Park from Wesleyan in 2010, Mirrors for Gold from Krupskaya in 2006, and Toto in Alora 
from Libros to Magenta 2015. These were uh, selected poems in Spanish translation. His most recent book, Still Nowhere in an Empty Vastness, is a Latinx poetics on colonial settlement and cultural counter conquest in art and writing of the Americas. And he is the Hugh Roy and Lily Kranz Cullen Distinguished Professor in Creative Writing and Art History at the University of Houston. It's really my pleasure to introduce this conversation and I am going to turn it over to Levi to begin uh, talking to us about coalition dispatches from the end of communication. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, hi to everyone inside my screen. I just want to- We can hear you. You sound great, David. Yeah, okay, good, thanks. I just want to try to give you a taste or a glimpse of the, of the whole book. Um, and it begins with these two epigraphs. Just remember what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. And it's always hard to beat the enemy when you can't see it. The second one could be referring to the coronavirus pandemic, which Trump has called the invisible enemy. But both of these are actually from the summer of 2018. The first is Trump speaking to the National Convention of the Veterans of Foreign Wars in Kansas City on July 24th, 2018. And the second one is Trump speaking to the Army's 10th Mountain Division at Fort Drum, New York on August 13th, 2018. Just remember what you're seeing and what you're reading is not what's happening. And it's always hard to beat the enemy when you can't see it. So the first part of the book includes 35 dispatches written at the Republican and Democratic conventions in 2016 in Cleveland and Philadelphia and after leading up to the election of 2016. These dispatches are first, first-hand real-time accounts of what I heard and saw on the ground at the conventions. And they are accompanied by photographs from the conventions by the great documentary photographer, Susan Mycelis from Magnum. All these photo photographs are in the book. It looks like there's probably um, not going to be the Kind of the same kind of conventions this year and maybe never again. So those in 2016 may have been the end of that. Although I doubt the go away entirely because we seem to be, we seem to need to do them as a certain kind of performance of our commitment to electoral politics. If that continues, we'll see in this next week. But that outward real-time bodily display has now turned inward to personal screens in isolation. The political unconscious has become disembodied, a projected field of fantasy. This is dispatch 14 from the Democratic Convention in Philadelphia on July 29th, 2016. Dispatch 14, Reality Tunnel. On the morning after Hillary Clinton accepted her party's nomination for the presidency, Donald Trump is saying, quote, I watched them last night and they're not talking about the real world. And Fox News is saying something similar. It was nice, but the world they're talking about is not real. Over the last four days, in a myriad of ways, Democrats have said the same thing about the Republicans. The coming campaign over the next 100 days is not going to be about competing policy proposals and plans, but about the nature of reality. It must only be a matter of time before people begin to pepper their political speeches with references to Plato's ideal forms and Kant's the thing itself, and the noumenal world as opposed to, the pheno to phenomenal knowledge. Or perhaps someone will recover the term Timothy Leary coined in the 1970s, reality tunnel, to refer to the way each person constructs a view of the world according to her or his experiences and beliefs. The idea was developed further by Robert Anton Wilson, who said Trumpishly, reality is what you can get away with. In the book Leary and Wilson wrote together, Neuropolitik, they say, quote, the gene pool politics which monitor power struggles among terrestrial humanity are transcended in this info world. 
i.e. seen as static artificial charades. One is neither coercively manipulated into another's territorial reality nor forced to struggle against it with reciprocal emotional game playing, the usual soap opera dramatics. One simply elects consciously whether or not to share the other's reality tunnel. Both parties are currently saying not, so the coming election, perhaps more than any other in history, is going to be an ontological referendum. And the two political conventions we have just witnessed have been ontological catalogs, limiting two very different views of reality. Last night in the Wells Fargo Arena in Philadelphia, the Democrats framed the conflict as that between love and hate and between hope and fear. Bernie Sanders supporters staged one last ditch protest against Hillary's hawkishness, trying to shout down the assembled generals with chants of no more war, no more war. But their cries were invaded by and dissolved in the competing three syllable chants of USA, USA, and Hillary, Hillary. Conservative commentator David Brooks, who I kept running into in Philadelphia, wrote a column last night for the New York Times pointing out that Donald Trump has figured out, quote, an ingenious way to save the Democratic Party, unquote, by abandoning patriotism and allowing Democrats to seize that ground. Quote, if you visited two conventions this year, he wrote, you would have come away thinking that the Democrats are the more patriotic of the two parties and the more culturally conservative. Brooks concluded that the Democrats had a better convention than the Republicans with better speeches and a much more substantive and coherent program. But he cautioned, the normal rules may no longer apply. The Democrats may have dominated a game we are no longer playing. As I watched Hillary on stage last night, resplendent in a glowing white suit before white stars on a blue ground, with the capacity crowd enthusiastically waving their sign signs and sign sticks. I thought that the epic change we're going through from written and spoken language to the image and from policy to perception is making a quantum leap in this campaign on both sides. Under the old rules, insight and thoughtful policy proposals still mattered. In the new world of tweets and leaks and bombast and bluster, all that matters are the images projected on the walls of your own particular reality tunnel. Part two of the book begins just after the election with this prologue to the theater after Faust. The first photograph here is by me and the rest of the photographs in this section are by the Magnum photographer, Peter von Ockmel. Prologue in the theater after Faust. Hello, welcome to our world. It's yours too now in a way, you built it. We understand that many of you thought it would turn out differently and lead to some democracy of affect, but you must have noticed the changes. You must have seen them coming up on your screens. You must have noticed as the images began to separate from their reference. You told yourselves it was a temporary spectral shift or a minor glitch in the iconosphere, but you must have seen it. When we saw it, we knew that the image had been set free. It was no longer bound by the old rules. The change began years ago, soon after Stuart Brand proclaimed that information wants to be free. Then the image became information. And once it was free of its old bond to the referent, to the signified, it became possible to move images around at will and to make our own reality. Our father taught us how to move them around. Grandmother used to call it the effet de réel in a fake French accent and laugh. We are the disruption you've been preparing, preparing for all this time. We know who you are because he knows who you are, defined by what you want and fear. We were raised in the knowledge that we would eventually and inevitably control the future by simply reflecting your own desires and fears back to you. We were trained in these secrets of the black mirror. 
trained to rule. We always knew the time would eventually come. We know that many of you were surprised when it happened, but you shouldn't have been. When the social died, it was replaced by social media, and that was made for our father. When everything and everyone became connected, everything and everyone became controllable. When everyone turned the camera around on himself or herself, the circuit was closed. You freely gave up all your information, including your image, and clamored to be told what to do. Much about the change is still misunderstood. We are actually against politics per se. In our world, there's no more class, no more alienation, no more identification with the other. Everyone wants to be like us. We are the revolution now, a revolution of the image, and soon everything will be revealed. And the second half of the book is written in the voices of the regime and in the voices of complicity. This is the world on the screens. The images on the screens have become better and more beautiful over time because I decide what comes up on my screens. I am in control of my own feed and I choose from among an infinity of choices. I am free because information is free. Because I'm free, the old categories of right and left and right and wrong no longer apply to me. The old morality is dead. The old democracy has been disrupted. Our new democracy puts each user in control of his or her own destiny. Once I give up my personal privacy, I can choose anything I want from the infinity of choices provided by other users. Everything that exists, exists on the screens. There's nothing outside of the screens. The world on the screens is beautiful. All human problems can be solved quickly and easily. We can eradicate world hunger, cure all disease, do away with poverty and racism, and stop climate change. These are all just technical problems, believe me. Politics is not the solution to our problems. Politics is the problem. No one is in power. Mark and Jeff and Eric and Steve are not in power. Donald is not in power. We are no longer citizens. We are greater than that. We are singular. We are singular. We are singular. And this is Trump talks. You all talk a lot about the way Trump talks. You all have a big problem with the way he talks. You think the way he talks is unbecoming to a president. But for us, the way he talks sounds just right. He's not talk talking down to us, but straight at us. The black president was a master of your kind of talk. He wasn't quite as bad as Al Gore or Hillary Clinton, but he still talked like he was better than us, like he was trying to teach us something. Trump might be rich, but he knows how to talk to people who aren't rich. He's got the common touch. His talk reaches out and touches us. And that's what we've been waiting for, to have, one, to have someone reach out like that. When Trump talks, you're always trying to catch him up on something, to catch him in a mistake. And then you do, but it doesn't make any difference because it's not about that. It's not a game. It's a real communication, person to person. You hate that because if that caught on, your position in the world would be diminished. No one would need you to interpret everything, to decode and complicate everything, and to ask all your well-considered questions. Your work, the task and skills that define you would be obsolete. How do you think that would feel to be obsolete? to have everything you know devalued and diminished and denigrated. What do you think you'd do then? And this is reuse this content. Don't think of me as one of the wealthiest people in the world or as the CEO of one of the largest and most powerful corporations in the world that owns most of your data 
and knows more about you than your mother ever will. Think of me as a friend trying to help. Look, it should be clear by now, even to those of you who weren't smart enough as a teenager to build a company that now earns $8.8 .8 billion in one quarter and has 1.86 billion customers, that the whole government thing is not working. The world is too important a place to leave its governance to whatever old timer can convince enough people to vote for them in a democratic election. If we're going to build a global community that works for all of us, that prevents harm, helps during crises and rebuilds afterward, it's going to have to be run by someone who knows how to control masses of people, who knows, for instance, how to get masses of people to freely give up their personal privacy in a totally unaccountable, to a totally unaccountable corporation and then to pay for the privilege. In the magic of money and change making, Trump is old news compared to me. Just look at the numbers. He has good attitudes about some things, but he's still old. Old people, sorry, I mean older people, I'm trying to change that, have experience, but unfortunately their experience is mostly obsolete because it's from analog time. It's not their fault exactly, the world has just passed them by but they shouldn't worry because we're going to include them in the new world we're building. We actually like having them around for diversity and color. And they can use the same infrastructure as we do if they can figure out how to use it. They'll need to change some of their attitudes, of course. We can do without all that self-defeating talk about the surveillance state and personal privacy and critical thinking but they're welcome to participate and communicate with the rest of us through Facebook as we make further leaps from tribes to cities to nations to a global community built around our platforms. It's going to be so good. F is for fake. Last week, I invented the word fake. I don't know why nobody had thought of it before. It's the perfect word the best word I've come up with. When the elites make something up about me, it's fake, like fake news. It means they just make it up. It's the making fake. It's a full-time job for some of these losers. When I say believe me, that means it's true. When they, some, when they say something's true, it means it fits in with their skewed view of me. They use it to try to stop me. You can believe me or you can believe CNN, but you can't believe both. You have to make a choice. That's what you did in the election. You chose me. That means CNN and the New York Times are finished. It's over. They're failing and I'm winning now. I've already won. This whole truth thing has always been used against me all my life and it's never stopped me. I have better ratings. I sell more copies. People like me better. Every once in a while, I'll say something true just to show that it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't hurt me. It can be true or not true. Who the fuck cares? I'm so much bigger than this. Do you know how long they've been trying to stop me with this truth shit? Do you know how many times I've beaten them over and over? You'd think maybe I could get a little, a little respect from them, a little break. But no, it's fact check this and evidence that, and it's a constitutional crisis and a special prosecutor with special subpoena powers. It never ends. Now they think they can get to me through my kids. And I love my kids, but they don't have what I have. I have the secret to the whole deal, the art of the deal. I learned it from a Japanese whale. Now I'm bulletproof. Nobody can get to me. What's true is that I am the most famous person on earth. In fact, I am the most famous person the world has ever seen. Think about it. And right now I'm the most powerful person on earth. I live in the White House and I can do whatever I want. That's the truth. Culture Kampf. When I hear the word culture, I reach for my dick. People talk about culture like it was a religion, like it was holy. 
but I figured out a long time ago that culture is just, just something you buy when you have enough money and then have your wife take care of it. America turned into a junk culture a long time ago anyway. Reality TV caught the mood. Watching flawed people do flawed things, except me. I was always above it all in The Apprentice. I was above the junk, deciding who to fire. Now I've replaced culture. I'm the biggest and best show there is. No one else can compete with me. I'm like the best artist there's ever been. Could Picasso hold a crowd like this? Could that twink Andy Warhol? 15 minutes. Try seven decades. I always wanted to be a writer, and now look at me. I have a bigger readership than Hemingway ever dreamed of. They wait around for it, and then it goes everywhere. The big mistake before was to think you have to read to write. Why? I don't have time to read. I'm too busy writing the world, and people are too busy reading me to read anything else. They can't wait to see how it will all end. Even I don't know that but I know it'll be good. The Wharton School. Have you ever noticed how they always call the other side the elite? The elite. Why are they the elite? I have a much better apartment than they do. I'm smarter than they are. I'm richer than they are. I became president and they didn't. They're not the elite, I'm the elite. And now everyone knows it, but it eats at them. Oh yeah, it eats at them. They know that I know that they're fake. The whole thing is rigged. And so they're going to do whatever they can to destroy me, to destroy us and everything we're building. I've been dealing with this my whole life, but you should get ready for it. Get ready to fight back with everything you have. Do we believe in the Second Amendment? You bet your life we do. If they come to take away your guns, they're going to have a rude awakening, aren't they? the Justice Department, the crooked FBI, the whole deep state. And what about when they come to take your president after the witch hunt, after whatever trumped up charges they devise? What are you going to do to stop them? 90% of all Republicans are behind me now. So the battle is going to be between us and them, Republicans versus Democrats right versus wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. I'd prefer this to be resolved in an election. But if the election is rigged and they say I lost, then what? You saw how they reacted when I won the last time. I don't want to have to suspend the Constitution and declare martial law. But what if they force me into it? What am I going to do, back down? You know me better than that. And the book ends with the coda. This is just a bit of it. Um, the Trump phenomena went from candidacy to presidency to 24 seven omnipresence in a very short period of time. The utter dominance of the entire televisual and telematic space was achieved relatively effortlessly. And this sudden takeover of attention served to distract us from the concomitant larger changes in the public imaginary which will be far more consequential in the long run. People voted for Trump for the same reason they embraced new media technology, because both promised to disrupt the old order. And in both cases, the problem was that no one asked what the disruptors actually stood for and what they wanted. What is new about the Trump phenomenon is its unprecedentedly rapid transformation of public language and images. What used to take years or decades to achieve was accomplished in weeks and days. The collateral damage in this rebellion has been the language of politics itself. When it is all over, we are going to have to rebuild the infrastructure of civil discourse and of public speech. As with the financial crisis of 2008, it has been sobering to discover just how fragile this infrastructure turns out to be. Perhaps we need to find another way to communicate about important things. Thank you. So, Roberto. Levi, thank you. 
what am I doing here? Somebody needs to, the host has to unstop me there. Maybe Max, there, there we, go. we go. Very good to see you, Levi. I'm so excited to be talking about this book and thank you for the reading. I, um, you've talked a little bit about the structure of the book and read from it. I thought I'd go right into, I think one of the great contributions of this book is that you're outlining, as you say at the end, this rapid transformation of public language and images, this sort of communication environment that we're living in now and the new media that the world presents itself in. And that somehow through this nexus of what you call iconopolitics, words and images no longer can agree upon reality. And yet, and the mood I think of the book is not a hopeful one or maybe a promising one, but yet the, the entire book is a, is a commitment to the relationship between words and images as your other books have been. And clearly there was a decisive choice in selecting both the works of Susan Mizalis and Peter Van Akmal. And so I wonder if you could talk and we could begin the conversation with your deciding to use those photographs. Uh, I'm not clear as to whether you were interacting with Susan Mycellus at those um, conventions or not, or with Peter Van Akmal, but there's a relationship that you wanna set up that you've demonstrated in the, in the reading today between the various voices. Sometimes it's a sort of an author's voice and then the voice of the various figures, including Trump and um, Mark Zuckerberg, for example. So I think the question is really about the effects that text and image create by working together, sometimes a conflict. Yeah, that's how, I mean, that's how the text started. Um, the, the pieces at the convention started with uh, John Wynette, who's an artist who's been going to the conventions for many decades. And um, he asked me to write these dispatches and um, they would be accompanied online by his photographs, his and Alan Spore, his, his uh, um, collaborator there. And so that's, all these things were done in real time and, and were going up uh, in real time. Um, and they were very direct. Uh, it's not a kind of writing that I have done very much. Uh, because I've not acted as a um, legitimate journalist, and I was sort of impersonating one at the conventions. Although you did uh, have credentials. I had credentials, and, and that's the whole, I mean, what, if you have the credentials, you can do anything. Pretty much nobody pays any attention to you. It's like being invisible. It's fantastic. Um, but that's how it started. So it always had this relation to images. And um, then at a certain point, the book changed and changed into something else. The writing changed into something else. Um, those kind of images uh, were not going to work. And then I had run into uh, Susan at the conventions. And I've known Susan for a long time. Um, but we weren't working together. She was covering the convention and, and doing other stories the way she always does. And she, um, so at a certain point um, with MIT, uh, uh, Susan came in and she brought Peter von Ockmell. And I had known about his work and met Peter before. And I, I think he's magnificent, a magnificent photographer, documentary photographer. Um, so then, then the, the, those came in and it became, the collaboration was in the editing of the book and putting the book together uh, and putting the words with the images. But you're right that it's been a concern of mine for a long time, how these different languages coexist and influence one another. Um, and it's also, uh, part of uh, trying to react to what's happening, what was happening in the political life of the country. Um, the only way I knew to do it was as a writer to so to get into the language, to get into the language of Trump, to get into the language of what I see as voices in complicity, 
uh, other and and players in this um, in the communications environment that are having a great deal to the, these changes in the communications environment are having a great deal with to do with um, the changes in the politics. But it's all about the language. It's all about uh, collapsing collapsing distinctions that used to be there between different kinds of language. And that's that collapsed very quickly and Trump picked up on it. He, um, uh, he capitalized on it. But I think you counter it with this mode of storytelling and storytelling is a word you use in relation to Susan Micellis's work in an essay you published in Words Not Spent Today by Smaller Things. Right, maybe I'll just read a little bit of it, but you say at one point, more information does not necessarily increase realism. Information can be indigestible in its raw form and must be prepared differently in order to be effective, to be of use. Masses of data are not memorable. Images are memorable. Stories are memorable. As we move headlong into a world in which the delivery of information in images and words becomes more fluent and more rapid every day, the task of the storyteller is becoming more necessary and more endangered. And it seems to me that you've chosen uh, very consciously a, a, a series of literary formats or, and genres. I mean, the dispatch I associate with a, a mode in Latin America that you're familiar with, the testimonio or the cronica that like, Carlos Mosibais or Elena Poniatowska, two very great journalists, literary journalists have used, where you're able to, to get to this um, sort of effect. And you've said elsewhere that if you're in, if you're telling the story, you're in the story. And I think that's, <laughs> right? I think that's what you're trying to do in this, in, in the both parts of the book. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, that's very interesting because I, I've, I, I actually think that it's, the book is written in a, very old form. I'm calling it a uh, picaresque documentary. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's episodic uh, in these dispatches. It does, there's no pro plot development, really. It's all about these characters and the language they use. And it turns out, I think, that Trump is the perfect picaro. He is a rogue, a scoundrel, a, uh, who is living by his wits and coming up against a hypocritical and corrupt society. That's the way people who support him see him. Right. Uh, and he also adheres to the, uh, the directive that once a picaro, always a picaro. So he doesn't change. He doesn't learn nothing. He hasn't changed anything from the very beginning. I mean, Liberals are, and and some Republicans uh, are always saying, "Well, you know, it will grow into it." <laughs> he hasn't changed anything, and that's the picaro. Um, so there are comedic aspects to it, certainly in the in the story. I mean, I thank God, uh, you know, narcissism and being a blowhard is still funny. Um, but uh, you know, it's a compelling it's a compelling character to forty percent of the electorate. I mean, sixty three million people voted for him and may vote for him again, uh, and they see him as you know blowing things up. He's coming in. He's a disruptor. He's the ultimate disruptor. Um, it's kind of it's the rights version of disturbing the bourgeoisie, mm -hmm. only this is disturbing the liberal elites, but it's kind of, it's the same impulse, I think. I mean, there's another thread that's tied to what you're saying now in the book, maybe it was less present in what you read today, but you've, you've outlined also that there's something is changing radically in this new communication environment about subjectivity itself. And so you inhabit various subjectivities, right? That there's a kind of, the, that on the, in the social media we're meant to sort of, there's a kind of performance of the self for the sake of popularity or for hits and likes and followers in this attention economy. And it, it seems to me that you're making this relationship to the, to the 
um, to the relationship between the, the truth effect of the photograph. Absolutely, absolutely. And in my, in my terms, you know, these surveillance empires of Apple, uh, Amazon, Facebook, and Google are uh, these giant corporations who are going head to head with democracy now. And basically they steal our private experience. That's the, that's the business model, which to me uh, uh, looks like an assault on subjectivity. It's an assault on social subjectivity. And it's the, it's the apotheosis of capital. It's where this was all going. I mean, John Berger saw this a long time ago. Um, the the destruction of social subjectivity or the uh, the buying of it. I mean, the cruel irony is though that we've given it up gladly and willfully. Absolutely, free. Uh, you can agree. I agree. That's all you have to do. I agree. <laughs> There's something about both the photographs of Susan Mize Ellis and, and Van Achmel that I'm certain that you are drawn to, which is that there, there is a kind of intoxication, uh, understandably, with the stagecraft of the convention as a kind of performance, spectacle, phantasmagoria, that is not unrelated to statecraft. And you've been doing uh, that since the, really since maybe earlier than the year 2000, but I, I definitely remember from the last democracy, the last campaign, which was your project in the year 2000 election, that there, that was part of the, uh, one of the questions you went into the project with was to what degree does stagecraft replicate, reflect statecraft? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a big, that's definitely a big part of it. I mean, I've talked with um, Susan and Peter about it a bit. Um, and uh, as I describe it, the, the conventions, I mean, I've been, I've been attracted to electoral politics since I was very young in Kansas. And I think a lot of the, what I was attracted to was this performance, this spectacle, um, even of the conventions. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the next two weeks, um, virtually. I don't, I don't know how that, <laughs> I don't know what that's gonna look like. But um, so, yeah, I mean, when I first uh, stepped into this uh, convention environment, um, it was like being inside the machine for making images. Um, for making political words and images. And um, it was like being backstage. I, I loved, I have to say, I loved it. Um, it was exhilarating and very, very strange. Um, and I, that, that strangeness never, never abated for me. But I think, um, I mean, both Susan and Peter are seasoned photojournalists and documentarians. So they've seen everything and they've worked in impossible conditions. Um, so I think they probably see it a good bit differently than I do, but. Well, I think that you were going for something in the text that is not unlike what a photograph can do, which is the, to bring together those strange alignments or those accidents, right? So also the body language say, I mean, I think I just keep thinking of my zealousness um, I mean, incredible photographs, say the one of Mike Pence, which is layered. So we see him on the jumbotron, but what we're really sort of concentrating on is the, the body um, display of the crowds below, or uh, in, the, in the case of, there's a photograph, I don't think you showed it today, of Michelle Obama, who is in very high definition compared to the sort of uh, abstract field in which she's, she's cast. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, even with um, the chaos and uh, uh, incompetence of the Republican convention, I mean, it really was kind of a mess from beginning to end, but still that the spectacle part of it was operational. Um, but it too started to break down. I mean, that photograph at the beginning that I took of the blind singer from Kentucky singing the national anthem and behind 
you see a, a screen that's filled with the American flag, but there, it's starting to separate. And it actually, the, the screen separated. And that happened a few times. Uh, it happened once when um, one of the Trump scions was talking and, and it, it just, the image started to break up and come apart. Um, so, and as you say, I mean, I, the, uh, uh, both Susan and Peter are very attuned to, to those slippages and those uh, catastrophes. Yeah. I see that there, there are some questions coming up, but I want to ask one last question possibly before we go to some of the audience um, remarks, which is that I wonder if you've given thought now that the, the book has appeared and we're in the year 2020 and you, I think the last sign off date is 2018 and the image environment has really changed radically, I think since then, especially with the developments around racial justice that came from the kind of citizen reporter of like Darnella Fraser who captured the killing of George Floyd. And it seems to me that that kind of image is a, is a way of getting around the totalizing or totalitarian um, field that the social media seem to be, and you seem to be underlining about, about the image in this new iconopolitics. It can be, and um, yeah, you're right to point to that. And I, I've written about it, I wrote about it at length actually, um, her video. Um, and it's, it's very rare actually, and it's very strange in its affect because this guy, Chauvin, who is the murderer, is looking right into the camera lens with intent. And uh, that's, that just doesn't happen, that you're, you're actually seeing a murder uh, in real time. Um, and how old, she's like 17 years old, right. the, the, the kind of presence that it took to do that. Um, but yes, from the beginning, I mean, we all thought that having a, having a, a quite a sophisticated camera, still camera and video camera, as it turns out, that was a, that was a mistake and a, a big surprise. Everybody having that in their pocket would change things uh, dramatically, and in some cases it has. And you, but it takes. It's a it's a kind of paradox because those things, even though they're instantaneous, take a long time to play out in the iconosphere. It, those changes are slow to happen, and it takes a lot of images to do it. Um, so, I mean, there are sites now on Twitch, for example. I see that the some of the protest movements in Seattle and Portland there'll be four hours of real time depiction of what's taking place. And it seems to me that that's a way of, of at least countering the, the immensity of the ways in which iconopolitics is being played from above. Let's think of this as coming from below. Yeah, yeah. There are, uh, you're absolutely right. There are um, some hopeful signs of that, but again, it takes time. It still takes time. And it takes time because of reception, not because of production. You can produce these things very rapidly, but because we're still in these bodies with these eyes and these hands and these receptors, it takes time to receive them and to be, and to be moved by them or to, to uh, affect change. That's great. Uh, this might be the perfect segue, Max, if we can start taking some of the audience questions. Yeah, thank you both for that great conversation and David for your reading. Um, it's been really amazing to learn more about this book. Um, and thank you to the audience who have submitted questions. If you have a question for David and Roberto, you can submit them here in the chat box or in the Q&A section at the bottom of the interface on Zoom or on YouTube directly in the comment section. I'm gonna start with a question from Nancy Hernandez who asked to, um, she's asking David if you, could, if you could elaborate on the secrets of the black mirror. 
That's a good question. <laughs> uh, well, here we are in front of the black mirror. I mean, the, basically the, all of these screens are um, what I consider the black mirror. And, um, you know, the progenitors are go back to, I always think of John Dee's scrying mirror, his, his black mirror, which um, I think comes from the Americas. It was actually from Mexico, uh, black uh, made out of uh, obsidian, I think. Um, so it, they, these black mirrors used to be scrying tools to look in, look through and see the future. Um, and now we all have them in our pockets and on our desks all the time. And um, it's miraculous. I mean, if you, if you could time travel and move from this period back a hundred years or so, um, it would just, it, it was this, you couldn't imagine this really. And it's all about these black mirrors. So, but I have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of things to say about the black mirror and the, the practice of the black mirror. Um, and there's this thing going on now that I'm trying to write about, um, but I think it's a ways off about the image actually separating from the screens, separating from the mirror. Um, and I don't, understand that so i have to write about it it's the it's the only way i can understand well it seems to me that happens if we no longer think of image as some sort of form uh, recognizable shape but as numbers because it seems to me the algorithms are doing this for us right and also images talking to images i mean you know a, a very high percentage of the images that are transmitted now are not intended for our reception at all they're they're talking to each other they're, they're, it's machine to machine and it's information uh, and that's that's a real difference I had a question from Emily Duvall about the political imaginary and capital um, she asks do you think the new di digital political fiction assigns a utilitarian value to each individual in their own narrative that's um, yeah, how does the political imaginary work in tandem with individual value? Um, Use value? Well, one thing I would say is that um, to these giant corporations who are now controlling the communications environment, and it looks like because of these hearings, the House hearings uh, a couple of weeks ago, it looks like Congress is probably finally going to begin to do something um, to regulate it, to control it, but um, it's going to take a long time. It'll take a decade or so. Um, to them, um, individuals, I mean, this has to do with the, the assault on subjectivity. To them, individual people are just um, units uh, uh, that are uh, monetized um, and as Roberta pointed out we all walked into this willingly um, we weren't forced to do it we, we walked into it willingly because how can you resist the black mirror it's magnificent I mean this having this on your desk uh, with unlimited images and unlimited almost unlimited access to information it's it's mesmerizing and uh, it intoxicates us. So we don't ask questions about how it got there <laughs> and who's giving it to us and what our relation to, to, uh, to them is. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. But. And then we have a question from Robert Kremens who's asking, how do you think these images connect with Susan Mycellus's earlier work from places like Nicaragua and Kurdistan? Um, well, I think um, Susan has gone through a lot of changes, but I think the, her concerns about depicting 
people and and their relation to it uh, has just gotten more complicated or more or deeper or more she's she's um, explored it in more areas in books in exhibitions in uh, online um, do you know if she has a um, an archival practice around these images because in, oh, those, yeah. in, in those two books the Kurdistan in particular there's an entire archive of, of, of images from an historic past to the present absolutely which is ongoing I mean it's all it's constantly collecting images and you know she she's made a couple of films she made a great film about going back to Nicaragua and finding the people that were in the photographs and talking to them and um, so her practice has, I, I would say, just become richer and and deeper. Um, but the the themes of um, conflict and struggle for representation, I think, go go back, go all the way back. Uh, we have a we have an interesting question that's talking about the way in which images are used. Um, contrary to the way, or maybe in a similar way to the way that uh, the far right uses images and language. Um, and this question comes from uh, today's Pulse on YouTube. They ask, a younger generation is mobilizing through protest at the largest scale in America's history. Might social media usher in a new politics? Are these not growing pains? I would love to think so. Uh... I hope so. I dearly hope so. Um, but I think that it's uncertain how or whether we'll be able to get out of this. Um, uh, yeah, there are. There have been tremendous possibilities um, with social media, but uh, in the in in the end, on balance, um, it's just been extremely destructive to the social. I would say, um, so but I keep it, looking for you know signs of hope. I mean, it seems it's also a question of of speed, and you you suggest this in the book that to the degree that one maximizes attention, like the social media do, you minimize scrutiny. And I'm just thinking of the way the far right has used meme culture, for example, to sort of spread disinformation. It moves so quickly that we have rarely have time that storytelling obliges of slow, of, of really taking time to create the, to read the uh, relationships of contingency be between the image and, and, its, and its, its reference. Absolutely. And it, you know, as, as Virilio knew, speed has a politics. It, it's a lot about speed. Um, but it's also, um, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my train there. Um, oh, I was just thinking that, I mean, people, for the same reason that people slow down and stop on a highway to look at a car crash, it's the same impulse that makes them click on uh, crazy conspiracy theories and, and hate speech and, um, and all of these things. Uh, it's kind of built into the receptor, which is why I, I'm not sure it can be recovered, at least in its present form. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know how this, I don't know what the next step is and I don't know how to get out of this, but I, I think we're in a, a very tenuous spot right now. Um, I think we have to figure out some other way to communicate about important things. And uh, I don't know what those platforms are gonna be. I mean, I also think it's a question of pedagogy and teaching. I don't think that we really have, we're well equipped yet to, uh, to teach at the, primary and secondary level, what it means to deal with these images. Because to me, that is the political imaginary, is the, the degree to which we are able to, tra 
what is important, that something is important enough for it to exist in the future, for it to be transmitted in the future. And that's what teaching is about. But I, I just don't think that the acceleration has permitted us to catch up. Right, right. That's, I think that's the problem that uh, the speed is, uh, again, it has a politics because it, it uh, occludes certain kinds of response and certain kinds of considered response. Mm -hmm. um, that's the problem. That's the big problem. There's an interesting question that is um, that works well with what you were last talking about because it's essentially um, a question about this seemingly this problem with images and languages. Uh, images and language isn't a new uh, problem. We've had it for a hundred years, and and so Harbir Sandhu writes. Uh, is this really all that new? The phrase political fictions harkens back directly to Joan Didion's essay slash book about George Bush Sr.'s stage photograph, Taking a Moment, to play catch beside Air Force Two, or Air Force, yeah, while on the campaign trail in 1988. And Trump is direct, a direct lineage back to Roy Cohn and McCarthyism, and its blacklists. Seems like Cohn really exploded the concept of truth or consensual reality back in the 1950s. Um, yeah. He also references Speed Has a Politics by Marionetti uh, from the Futurist Manifesto. <laughs> yeah, I prefer Virilio to Marionetti on Speed, but... Um, I mean, part of the problem is what you've said, Levi, which is that the, the, the reach of the technology in our... In, in, to, the access of technology at the, at the palm of our hands and in our pockets is unprecedented. So it's a very different... Um, ecosystem. Absolutely. But I mean, what, what the questioner was saying is true that th it, these things have a history. Yeah. Um, history is a story and a story has a beginning and an end and, and it has all kinds of things that happen all, all, all the way along. So, um, I mean, it's, that's, you can uh, certainly, if you, if you move out of time, if, I mean, I always think that one of the worst things, one of the worst hells I can imagine is being stuck in your own time. <laughs> um, and if you can move out of that time into a past, you can uh, off, I mean, everything new is found in the past. <laughs> That's the way it works. Welcome to quarantine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, going, it's not just photographic images. I mean, this goes back to any kind of representation. It goes back centuries and centuries um, in terms of, uh, and some examples might be um, the Romans and their uh, statuary depicting the emperors. Um, but um, yeah, it does seem that um, uh, a powerful leader often understands the um, use value of these images and how to manipulate them. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, my, this book is really trying to deal, trying to come to terms, trying to account for the position that we were in now and that we've gotten in over the last four years, eight years. Um, <laughs> and um, because I am focused on images, I think of things in those terms and, uh, and how words and images work together. Uh, and part of these changes are political and they'll have to be dealt with in political terms. But part of them are cultural and perceptual. And I'm hoping that this book is, you know, will be a catalyst for that kind of attention to, to these questions, the questions that are, that are insistent at this point questions that are absolutely necessary. Wow. Levi, Roberto, thank you so much. This has been scintillating. Great conversation. I look forward to holding the book in my hand. Um, and we have uh, information in the chat and on the, um, on the announcements that we sent out for the talk about how you can order the book. And Max, do you have that also at the end? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, so we really appreciate, uh, you sharing this time with us and, and your intellect and, um, 
it's fascinating to be talking about this right now as we're living it um, and things things change every day. So thank you very much. Thanks um, for doing so, it. Thank you, Levi. Thank absolutely. you, Stephen. Thank you, Max. Thank you. All. And uh, Max, Max Fields, thank you very much. Vinod Hobson, thank you very much. And the audience, thank you very much for joining us and for your questions. And um, we hope that you'll join us again this coming Saturday uh, at 2 p.m. Central for Rosanna Paulino and Martha Scott Burton. So have a great night. And uh, we all have a lot to think about. Yeah, thank you all very much. See you.